We're here to talk about big data. The big data revolution, this is our, uh, one of the most exciting aspects of genetics research, has been the revolution in sequencing our genomes. And this is illustrated in this snapshot here, where we have a whole run of A's and G's and C's and T's. This is our DNA code. And this data glove basically has sensors that allows us to measure the movement of every single joint of your hand. So we arrive in the lab, have breakfast together, do our desk work, clean up, do whatever we do while wearing these gloves and collecting the statistics of movements that you execute. And hopefully I'll convince you that big data is not only the most efficient, the most powerful tool that we have to, to really answer these fundamental physiological questions. It's, its proper name is not actually a slime mold, it's actually a social amoeba. But um, lots of people call it the slime mold and we call them slimes. Now, normally it exists as single cells in soil, but when the cells starve, they enter a multicellular program of differentiation, which can be seen from left to right. And that's actually one of the things I wanted to, to really do today, is to talk to you about chromosomes and share with you how colour is helping us understand how these chromosomes, the secrets really that lie within chromosomes, chromosomes are our uh, units of inheritance. And what you see encircled is one of the two X chromosomes. And if you print the entire sequence, you get a very big book. The book is about four kilos of weight. So I didn't bring it from Zurich. Instead, I brought the book of the Y chromosome. The entire known sequence of the Y is printed here. This is not just gray, this is actual code. But when we go, hopefully, to a page, here is a little bit of dark. These dark bits are the bits that contain information for a protein. And the cell manages to do this in a tiny little nucleus. So how do we deal with all this complexity? I mean, we have 500 million nerve cells in our gut. So we want to find out which are the molecules that matter, what do they do, where do they come from, um, which of these nerve cells um, regulate whether you eat that bag of crisps or not. We're using flies because this is simple. Um, but then now we end up with big data again. We end up with tons of, you know, with all these hundreds of thousands of fly feces. And how are we going to make sense of all these things? So your hands typically are thought to do two main things. You do a power grasp and a precision grip. If we now run big data algorithms, so algorithms that try to make sense out of all this variability, is that the three most important hand movements have nothing in common with what we think are the two most important hand movements. If you can do these three movements combined, you can do roughly 80% of all daily activities. And these look very different from this activity and this activity. In fact, I did this experiment myself wearing the glove. I didn't do this a single time during a whole day. All of these storage devices are outdated now. And who knows what will happen to the ones that you use now. This plant was around 3000 BC. And all along, this DNA is kept pretty much the same it was when it first germinated this tree. So maybe this would be a very good way to actually store data. Nature stores it not only very tightly, condensed, and over long periods of time, but even in individuals you can keep it for a long time. It would be even better if you could actually have clones through seeds. In Twitzbergen, in Svalbard, they have built this global seed vault where they store seeds of every species and accessions that we have collected over the last hundred years, where they are at the cold temperature in a dry climate, and they should survive thousands of years and still be able to germinate. So you could put your data on there, put it in the plant, make a seed and store the seed. How can I distinguish useful from useless data? I mean, it operates over lots and lots of different length scales, it operates over lots and lots of different length scales. Yeah, we transform the cell with foreign DNA. Yeah. So we talked about transformation. If you look at Wikipedia, what it essentially says is that big data is the term that has been applied for a collection of large data sets. The complexity of the data set is so large that it becomes very difficult to work with them using regular computer software. So the moment it becomes unmanageable, it's essentially called big data. So if you put them all together and ask what are some of the bigger challenges 
and the possibilities for potential that can be achieved using big data. So this slide essentially summarizes some of these key concepts. What we're demonstrating here is a suit that does motion capture. And as you can see, it's capturing all the movement that she does. We just fetch the numbers that the sensors spit out and we use them in our so algorithms. The output can but be just numbers? Yeah, I can show you the output actually. Can I? And then you have numbers and numbers and numbers. And every move. The virgin females, which have not mated, behave different from the females that have mated. <laughs> Can you mix their genes with something else? Yeah. So and then in create something new? Sure. So and you this guys are playing God. <laughs> yeah. It's quite nice to have a name on it. Our memories are fragile, like footsteps washed away by the sands of time. By 2050, the average person will have at least 8 terabytes of personal digital data. What if you could preserve these memories beyond a single lifetime? Welcome to a world of eternal possibility, only a click away. Treasured moments are easily uploaded to the SeedGem server, where seeds are used to record digital memories encoded in plant DNA, an opportunity to genetically engineer your very own designer plant. So we're called Botanical Spies and Ole was our scientist who was um, looking into the seeds and being able to have the seeds as holding data. Because whilst you can store a lot of data, I think having something as sort of an, a unanimate object that just stores data, it's not very meaningful to anyone. So that's when we started looking into um, if you could store memories or things that were actually meaningful. The opportunity is the fact that they can live on beyond your time. I thought it was really refreshing just to be able to have a different perspective of things because I think like scientific concepts are not something that we usually come into contact with. So it was just like being able to look at it from that angle and then seeing how to apply it that really opened up a whole new world, which I think was the point of the exhibition and this workshop anyway. So I think the design outcome was really fantastic and, and very creative and creative in ways that we as scientists who think along certain paths would have not gone. And I think actually the outcome of the, uh, of the design is, is actually really inspiring and we should think that further what they created. I think designers and all other areas have to, to really work together and have new perspectives and new approaches to what we do. A lot of the projects were about how to store data and how to move data yeah. uh, and how to make sense of it. And some of these design futuristic approaches are very valid and maybe not that futuristic. Maybe. Thank you.